Emily is coming here from San Francisco, Emily Gruber, um, and she's going to, to uh, talk about some of her research she did while at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, her research focuses on sort of the, the nexus between energy and water related issues and extractive industries. Um, she worked in a number of areas, including Hawaii. Um, and uh, she was kind enough to travel several thousand miles uh, to talk to us today about um, water use associated with coal mining and natural gas production. It's a very interesting comparative study um, done in Texas. So, Emily, thank, thank you. you. So, in part because I think that there are a number of different pieces of this work that I'd like to talk about a little bit today. If there's any point at which you have questions or just want to stop and call out something, please do. I hope this can be a little bit conversational. And if there are places where people want to focus more than others, stop me and we can spend some more time there. But as Jim said, I, I did a lot of work over the last few years on electricity fuel cycles and how they affect water consumption in particular. And I think in part because in a lot of cases, the extraction side hasn't been studied as much. What we really tried to focus on in this work was extraction in addition to some of the power plant stuff. And so I'll explain that a little bit more in a minute. But yeah, basically just going to be comparing the natural gas and the coal fired electricity fuel cycles in Texas. I'll get to why Texas in a little minute, not just because I'm from UT. Um, so what I'm gonna talk about today, in part why water consumption in the fossil fuel industry is actually interesting. And I think that this gets overlooked probably less here because the Marcellus is so close by. And so I think probably there's more talk about it here than there might be somewhere else. Um, so I'm gonna start there, then talk about how we define the boundaries for this life cycle analysis because as anyone who's ever tried life cycle analysis before probably knows very, very deeply, it's hard to define where you're gonna stop. In this case, we got kind of lucky and just defined our boundaries pretty much at the state line, which was helpful, but I'll get into that a little bit more later. Then I'll go into a bit about what we actually found um, from extraction, power plant cooling, emissions controls, et cetera, down in Texas, and explain why I think this is interesting and what it might mean outside of Texas. So first of all, just this is a way that I think about this a little bit just in terms of how the energy industry uses water. So there's quantity issues and quality issues just in terms of what you're using. You are taking some amount of water and consuming it. You are taking some amount of water and changing its quality perhaps. And then there's also this element of adequacy that affects both of those. So do you have adequate quantity to do what you wanna do and not have a major impact? Do you have adequate quality? That kind of thing. So what I'm focusing on today is quantity, but I just wanted to start off mentioning that that's not the only issue here. And, just to point out that the study does not address things like quality issues and adequacy issues, all that directly. So why I think this is interesting, the water and energy relationship that we see in the United States and really all over the world is changing fairly rapidly for a number of big reasons. Some of the macro trends we see, of course, are climate change, big widespread droughts, and that's something that we felt very, very deeply in Texas over the last few years. Actually, while I was writing this paper, I had put a placeholder for the amount of Texas that had experienced severe drought in 2010, expecting the answer to be somewhere around 90%. The, uh, the real answer was 100%. So drought is a big issue down there and increasingly across the rest of the world. Um, and then also just the trend in the US particularly that is a long-term trend really of natural gas and coal being very dominant fuels in the electricity production sector. Some of the more recent changes and some of the things that are a little bit more localized are things like the rise of hydraulic fracturing. So the impact of energy use on water has changed a lot since we started fracking wells. Something else being aging power plant infrastructure. So older plants tend to be less efficient and also get less efficient as they age. So that can have big impacts on cooling and stuff like that and also changing power market structures. So in Texas in particular, what we have is competitive markets, which means a lot of the time you can't rely on just saying statewide, these plants are your baseload plants that are going to run all the time and be efficient all the time, and these plants are your peakers, and we know that, and we design them to be that way. What you see increasingly is that plants are called to operate in ways that they might not have been designed to do, and so that can affect the way that they use water, um, both on the emissions control side and on the cooling side, actually. Then the data. Why this is interesting to study, I think, is because the water and energy relationship is really pretty undercharacterized. That's changed a bit, but really when you look at a lot of the recent work even that has been published over the last few years, you keep coming back to this one citation from 1994. And that's really what we know about water and extraction in particular 
some of the data on power plant water use and stuff is a bit newer, but really there's not a lot of work done in water. There's great work done in air emissions, there's great work done in waste, stuff like that, although that's developing as well, but water I think tends to be particularly undercharacterized. Part of the reason we didn't look at quality in this paper is because that is so undercharacterized under that we couldn't really even get at good data that we felt comfortable using in a publication. So to kind of explain what I'm going to be talking about when I say fuel cycle, what we really looked at from the electricity perspective is three major stages during the life of a kilowatt hour. So there's the extraction stage where you get your, in this case, your coal or natural gas. You move on to power generation where your big impact on water tends to be cooling and then on the back end you tend to have emissions controls. That's less common in the natural gas fuel cycle but for, for completeness it could start to be more prevalent there, especially as we get into carbon capture. We can go into that a little bit more later. But I think some of the interesting things to note here are that on the extraction side, what you really have is a bifurcation between natural gas and coal, in that with natural gas, when you use water, you put it down hole. You keep it down there, you use it as drilling mud, you, drill it, you use it as frac fluid, stuff like that. You produce some of it, but ultimately you are putting water into the system to get gas out. On the coal side, and realizing that this is a Texas context, so I'm talking about surface mining, and surface mining particularly in aquifers, really what you have to do is take water out of the system. So in an ideal world, you'd be using pretty much no water at all, but because you need to keep your coal face dry, you have to pump a lot of water out of these systems before you can get at your coal, and that has some impacts on how you use water outside of that. Um, and also on the coal side, although this is something that is a little bit less important right now in a lot of areas where mining is ongoing, revegetation, so putting the trees in the fields and whatever it was that was on top of the coal mine before you started mining back on there can take a lot of water because reestablishing plants and stuff like that. I'm sure you've all had gardens where you stopped watering your plant for a little while and it died. Same thing happens on top of coal mines and that turns out to be a huge water usage actually. Didn't go into that here because most of the Texas mines haven't been shut down yet, but just to note that that's an issue. Um, in both cases for power generation, we're really talking about cooling um, in terms of water use. And on the extraction, on the emission side rather, for coal, what I'm gonna talk about today is the sulfur controls. So flue gas scrubbers and things like that. Some of the other controls that you might see for particulates or NOx and things like that don't really use water, so they're excluded here, just to give you a sense of what we're talking about. So on the defining the boundaries point, a couple issues to talk about here. When we were trying to figure out how to do this life cycle analysis, looking at Texas in particular, because that's where we had good data, um, we decided that we wanted to look basically at the water consumption that was occurring within the state. So from a geographic perspective, defining that state boundary was an easy step. Defining what exactly fell into that state boundary was a little harder. So this graph kind of shows um, a little bit of what I'm talking about in that we decided to include all gas and coal that was extracted within the state that was used within the state for power generation. So this excludes some of the gas that gets exported, for example, and it also excludes a lot of the coal that gets imported. Texas imports about two thirds of its coal. Turns out that that coal, which is coming from Wyoming, doesn't use a lot of water, so it's not a huge analytical detail to omit it. That said, it's still something that we did omit. Then looking a little bit more closely at some of these boxes, on the extraction side, we included dewatering and other mine uses like that for the coal. On the gas side, we looked not only at drilling mud and frac fluid, but also at the embedded water in propens and chemicals. We had to make a few assumptions on that side, and we can talk more about that offline or during this, whatever people have appetite for. But that was probably one of the more interesting things we did because we had to go off of economic models. Because um, obviously, if you don't really know what those chemicals are, if you don't know whether you're using manufactured propent or sand, it's hard to tell what kind of water is actually embedded into those systems, but we made an attempt. We excluded transportation, so train transportation, pipeline transportation, because it's really not a big water use. And the, at this high level, it didn't make a big difference. We did a little bit of sensitivity and ultimately decided to exclude it. And then downstream, we included cooling and on the emissions control side, both the direct water use for flue gas scrubbing and the water that's embedded in limestone and stuff like that that you're actually using in a scrubber. So when you mine limestone to then put into your scrubber, you use some water, much the same way you use it in a coal mine actually. It's largely dewatering and storm water removal. So basically included extraction, cooling water, and emissions controls with a couple of indirect effects of chemicals and propens and sulfur uh, scrubbing materials. So just to give a quick overview, 
again, what we looked at on the extraction side was 11 specific unconventional gas basins and then conventional gas. We didn't look at offshore, but we looked basically at what you might use for a conventional well that is not fracked and then what you might use for an unconventional well that is fracked in 11 separate situations. On the coal side, what we looked at was the dewatering and then also the other mine uses. So to kind of give you a sense of what the dewatering use is, if you've got this coal mine, this kind of trapezoidal shape, in order to keep it dry wherever you're mining, you need to pump a lot of water out that tends to form what's called a cone of depression. So you take out a lot more water than just the volume of the mine. That varies by geology, et cetera. Um, and in Texas, this is a somewhat controversial definition perhaps, but the Texas Water Development Board defines all of that water as consumptive. This is controversial because when you think about coal, it's a lot like a Brita, Brita filter for water. So a lot of the time, the water that you're actually pumping out of these mines is quite clean, unlike the water that you might put down a gas well or something like that. So although you are taking it out of the mine and then discharging it somewhere, and though that is considered consumption, it's a very different type of consumption than you might see on the gas side. So even though this is counted as consumed, it's still contributing to stream water flow, that kind of thing. So just to call that out a little bit, it's pretty clean water that's coming out of these mines. But that said, it does draw down aquifers, and that can be a big deal in a state like Texas where drought is so significant that if you are ultimately discharging that water into the Gulf, you're not going to get it back. Um, and that can be a pretty big problem for you. Can I ask you? Yeah. I mean, a lot of natural gas, I'm sure you'll get to this, they, they re inject. You just don't re inject coal, uh, you, coal water that you've extracted? No, it doesn't make all that much sense just because the mines are small enough and a small enough user that it's not a huge deal. And so since they've been there for quite a while, they've kind of gotten used to discharging. And it does contribute to stream flow. There probably is some downstream use. But where that's not specifically called out, it's considered consumption. So yeah, the, the re-injecting poses a bit of a problem because you'd be flooding your mine again because they're well, shallow enough. Down yeah. <laughs> Texas is pretty flat, though. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I think. <laughs> This is, this is, again, why I keep mentioning Texas, 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 because in a lot of the coal mines on this, side of the, on this side of the world, like in the Appalachians, you would not have these same problems. So the Texas mines in particular are unusual in their shallowness. They're lignite mines, and so they're basically still very close to the time at which they were swamps. Um, so there's a lot of water in there. You get the same thing up in North Dakota, less so in other basins. On the cooling side, what's kind of interesting is that we were comparing natural gas combined cycle plants with pulverized coal plants just because that's kind of what you see on baseload to baseload comparisons down in Texas. And I think that's fairly true in most of the United States at least. What we ended up seeing was that you get a huge advantage on cooling water needs in NGCCs versus pulverized coal plants, not just because they're a lot more efficient typically, but because they're partially air cooled. So the combined cycle bit, you've got a gas turbine and then a steam turbine. The gas turbine part's air cooled, so you're not using any water. And then the steam turbine part is cooled with water, much like a coal plant. The entire coal plant is being cooled with water. To bring this a little bit farther is kind of a side note. Typically, you see natural gas-fired power plants, combined cycles, use the least amount of water um, of the water-cooled ones, then coal plants because they use some water to cool and emit some of their heat to the atmosphere. And then nuclear plants use the most because none of that heat is going to atmosphere for obvious reasons, so you need a lot more water to cool them. So interesting side note, at least to me. Um, but we do see that effect pretty strongly. And so if we were comparing, for example, IGCCs, so integrated gasification combined cycle coal plants with NGCCs, we probably would have seen less disparity between the cooling uses. I'll get, that to, get to that in a minute. But because those aren't actually really used, um, we decided to go off of existing, existing types of power plants. And then on the scrubber side, I alluded to this a little bit earlier, but basic, oh, this is an animation. Yeah. Cool. It wasn't on my computer. Exciting. <laughs> but basically, you've got water that you're blowing into this scrubber. Then you're also injecting basically limestone powder and pulling out the sulfur by having it absorb onto the, the limestone. So you end up using water both to extract that limestone and to directly cool the wet scrubber. It is true that there are certain plants in Texas that use dry scrubbers. We took that into account, but by and large, where you're seeing water uses for these. So in Texas, what we found was that the natural gas combined cycle plants over their fuel cycle in these steps that I described, and including the second order effects of propens, chemicals, limestone, all of that, used about 40% as much water per kilowatt hour as the pulverized coal plants that are currently operating. Um, 
this is based on plant level data. We actually did have data for each pulverized coal plant that's operating in Texas and the average for all the NGCCs. Um, but just to call this out and walk through this waterfall a little bit, this big dark blue color is cooling water. So what you see here in both fuel cycles actually is that the cooling water accounts for about 80% of the water that you're consuming ultimately. The fuel bit, which is the next darker bar, in both cases accounts for between 10 and 20% of the fuel cycle water use, water consumption. Um, and then on the coal side, you've got a little bit of emissions. So walking through this, starting with the PC, the pulverized coal plant water consumption, it's about 0.61 gallons per kilowatt hour in Texas is what we calculated. We then calculated what that water consumption would be if the pulverized coal plant were running at the same heat rate as a natural gas combined cycle. So just to kind of get that effect out of the way. Um, and what you see is really the efficiency change is huge. Just the fact that natural gas plants tend to be more efficient, not only because they're newer, but because they're using the fuel twice the combined cycle thing. Um, you get a huge benefit from actually all areas just by being a lot more efficient. You're using less fuel. You are using more of your heat to turn into electricity, so you're not having to cool it as much, all that kind of thing. So the efficiency boost is huge. Then even on an efficiency parity point, Natural gas combined cycles use a bit less water. That's kind of the air cooling point that I made earlier. The really interesting thing to us was that on the fuel extraction side, natural gas plants on an efficiency parity basis use a little bit more water for fuel extraction than coal plants, but not much. Even when you account for the fact that there's all this imported coal that actually isn't using any water in Texas. So the the takeaway there is that because of the way that lignite mines work in Texas, and if you assume that dewatering is consumption, even with the impact of hydraulic fracturing, and even assuming that you get all of your two-thirds of your imported coal for free for water, the gas is not using that much more water per unit of energy that turns into electricity um, than the coal. And that was a surprise, because I think we were expecting to see that natural gas combined cycle plants were using a lot less water on the cooling side and obviously on the emissions side, because they don't have emissions controls typically. But to see that even with fracking, the water consumption for fuel is fairly similar was a pretty big surprise. We'll go into more detail on that in a minute. Then just to finish it up, the emissions controls, you get a boost on the gas side because you don't have them. And then ultimately, we get about a quarter of a gallon per kilowatt hour for a natural gas combined cycle plant. Yeah. Yeah, I, I know the quality is not was not part of the study, but yeah. it, for the cooling, do they do you require water at the same temperature for both of these? Uh, Roughly. About, about the same? So Texas plants, and this is kind of interesting because most coastal states, and Texas is a coastal state. I'm from California and had trouble accepting that for a little while, but it is coastal. <laughs> a lot of coastal states use seawater for power plant cooling. That's not really true in Texas because what you see is that refineries take up a lot of the industrial space on the coast, and so your power plants are further inland using streams. So yes, they take about the same temperature put out the same temperature. They're both using river water, typically. There are a couple of groundwater cooled plants, but not many. Yeah? Do you see a big change in uh, the, uh, the contribution to, of, of water use of natural gas when you do, do, you do a sensitivity analysis of the, uh, of the uh, chemicals production cycle? Or yeah. Do you see a big jump in that? Or? A little bit. This one, we kind of took our best guess estimate. But so on that, what we found was that in both cases, for propens and for chemicals, it was actually surprisingly close for each. But using some of our economic inputs, things like that, um, did a lot of digging through 10Ks of propent companies. Um, you get kind of the amount of water that you're using on site for a drill drilling situation, plus between about 8 and 30% each for the chemicals and the propens that you're using. That's the higher level is assuming, and again, because our boundary was Texas, the higher boundary is assuming that everything is manufactured, not mined, because you can mine some propens, and that it's all mined and manufactured in Texas. So all in, I think, probably overall, the propens and the chemicals together add about 60% to the on-site water use as the high end, about 20% on the low end. So because the extraction piece is small enough, you don't see a huge difference in the assumptions that you make at this level, but when you start going into really water used per million BTU or something like that, there's a bit of a change there. The bigger effect actually is which basin you're looking at. So I'll flip to that slide in just a minute, but what we found was that between unconventional gas across the 11 basins that we looked at, there was a spread of like two or three X depending on which basin it was. So there's also that going on a little bit. <laughs> 
maybe I will actually just start there because I think that this might be more interesting to talk about given that we're a little short on time. Um, you, yeah. You're entitled to go over. <laughs> <laughs> I want lots of questions though, and if people have to leave, I'd love to get to those. So this is, this is actually more interesting than the other stuff anyway, so <laughs> let's just go here. Um, Basically, this is a chart across the 11 unconventional basins we looked at, conventional gas and Texas lignite, of how much water per, I think my unit is gallons per million BTUs for each of these energy sources. So to walk through this a little bit, this red bar is conventional natural gas. So that's just drilling fluid. There's no frac fluid associated with that. This is just the mud that you keep the bit cool with, that kind of thing. Um, as you step through these other basins, and I'll point out a couple of things here in a minute, you see that on the high end, which we determined kind of the Barnett and the Haynesville were at the high end of water consumption, they're using kind of six gallons per million BTU, whereas things like the Anadarko Basin and the Eagleford are using more like two. One of the really interesting reasons for that, besides geologic setting, so like the Haynesville in particular is in a swampier area, so you might expect that the the rock is actually absorbing a little bit more of the water. You're probably getting a little bit less benefit out of the unit of water you put down to actually frack, stuff like that. Down on this side, you tend to see more of the basins that have a lot of oil. So not quite sure how to tease that one out. And actually, here we assumed that all the water was being attributed to natural gas or oil on a BTU basis. So there is an argument to be made that actually extracting oil takes a lot more water than taking natural gas out just because of the different viscosities and because of things like water flooding, those types of practices. So that number might actually even be smaller for the actual unit of associated gas you get in these very oily basins. But the, the key takeaway on that, I guess, is just there's a pretty big spread across all of these different basins. I'd love to get my hands on some good data for some of the other basins. The Marcellus in particular springs to mind. And there are a couple of other very, very water intensive ones that we know are more water intensive than the more common basins, but it's not totally clear how. So, so BTU yeah. is in the numerator. BTU per volume of gas? This is gallon per million BTU. Gallon of water. Yeah. Yes, that is the EUR weighted average, so the expected ultimate recovery weighted average for all of the natural gas produced in Texas onshore, so none of the big ultra deep wells offshore that are kind of interesting to look at, but <laughs> also a little harder to get data for. Um, but that's the onshore average for the 2010 to 2060 period projected. It includes some recycling. The numbers are from 2010, so there's an argument to be made that recycling will get a little bit better. But based on current technology, current recycling status, that kind of thing, as of 2010, this is the expected ultimate recovery weighted average for natural gas in Texas, it's about three gallons per million BTU. So what that immediately shows you is that the state is weighting much more toward these than the conventional gas, at least onshore, which is interesting in itself and confirmed by projections. So it was good that it worked out that way. But um, The, the point that I'd like to make about the coal, this bar is gallons per million BTU of coal produced in Texas out of those lignite basins. The dark brown is the non-dewatering consumption, so that's the stuff you're using to keep dust down um, for hoteling purposes, like toilets and stuff like that, which does count as land consumption a lot of the time because they use their own produced water for it. Um, equipment cooling, that kind of thing. The other 90% of it is dewatering water that is not assigned to a downstream user. In a few cases, the mines actually discharge with the intent of having somebody use that water further downstream. We took that water out. So this is stuff that is basically earmarked to go out to the Gulf from the aquifer. Um, and again, it was very surprising to us how big that number was. Also, again, I feel like I need to reiterate the caveat that that water is a lot cleaner than some of the water that you might be experiencing in other parts of the fuel chain. That said, it is still water that you're removing from its setting and making less usable in the future. And so based on state, um, state definitions, it is considered consumptive use. And so that, that large number on the coal, I think, was not expected by pretty much anyone. What we did a little bit of back of the envelope analysis to see what you might experience in some of the subbituminous basins, so the Wyoming coal, just because that's the other coal that Texas uses. 
evidence, and again, this is not based on great data, is that it's kind of five to 20% as high as this, so much, much smaller. Um, that's in part because those, those mines are both bigger and deeper, and also because they're not as much deeply in an aquifer as the lignite mines are. So in a couple of cases in Wyoming, you actually don't need to dewater the mine at all. You just get lucky with these sometimes 100 foot thick seams of coal that you don't need to dewater, which is convenient for the operators. But what it does mean is that the Texas lignite is particularly water intensive. Yeah? Is there no, it seems like there would be a So yes and no. One of the things about lignite, um, and you see this in North Dakota and you see it in Texas, is that most of the lignite mines are mine mouth, um, mine mouth mines, mine mouth plants rather, because of exactly that problem. Because it's lower energy density, it has a tendency to spontaneously combust when you transport it and when the dust starts getting aerosolized. And so what you do is take it directly from the mine into the power plant to avoid those problems. So you don't want to keep it wet. That's going to make it hard to burn. But you also don't want to transport it because it would catch on fire. Um, the other point in both of these cases, actually, which is quite different from some of the interior coals down in Illinois and some of the Appalachian coals that are through the, the East Coast, is that these coals, both the lignite and the subbituminous coal from Wyoming, are fairly low energy density, which means that processing them in any significant way is usually not worth it. They're big surface mines. You scoop up the coal. It's basically generally thick seams, and you don't have a lot of rock intermingled with it. If you did, you wouldn't be mining it because it wouldn't be worth it. So you're not using water for like flotation separation the way that you might out here. So that, that consumptive use that's not dewatering is almost exclusively dust control. So that's kind of the fun extraction stuff. Um, and then just, just to come back to this point a little bit, because the is dewatering actually consumption question is a valid one. This graph is the same version as the other one, but assuming that dewatering is not actually consumption. So what you see is that the, the increased water use for gas versus coal is quite a bit higher. And again, this is assuming that a lot of your coal has no water footprint at all and assuming the EUR rated, weighted average for gas. Um, so it's still not a huge effect, but it is quite a bit bigger if you assume that the dewatering is not actually consumption. But just to give that picture, efficiency is still the huge driver here. Yeah. Uh, this one? Or? No. no. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure what my question is, but for example, you said the Eagle Ford is, is oil rich. Yes. And if we're comparing that on a per BT basis to the car that which is natural gas, yeah. um, oil is not used to generate electricity. Right. This is million BTU of gas only. So we did cut out the oil versus gas production. I think to clarify the point I was making, it's just that you might actually be using more water than you would if it were only gas to get some of that oil out. But we looked at only the ultimate recovery for gas in calculating this part. So yeah, the, there shouldn't be any oil numbers intermingled in here. Um, we tried to check for that, but. <laughs> yeah, and I think uh, back for the, the hydraulic fracking, we go for uh, even though it produces a lot of water, it does not use more water than it is in Barnett. I think it's about the same. There's no water flooding as such that's done. It's just straight mm. hydraulic fracturing, pretty much the same as you would do in the Marcellus or Barnett. Yeah. So, so your assumptions are probably rocks. quite good. Yeah. But it was an interesting output. Um, I don't know that I expected that much spread across the different unconventional basins, actually. And again, I would love to see some outside of Texas um, that were analyzed in the same way, because this is basically based on an extensive survey of producers over, I think, about 10 years, and then projected out to 2060. So hard to get compared to One thing data. that's true of all of those basins compared, for example, to the Marcellus, is that in all those basins, you're getting back a lot more water. When you frack and then you get the flow back, you're yep. getting up to at least 50, sometimes 80% in those basins. Right. In the Marcellus, it's the opposite. You're getting 20% back in the Marcellus. You're leaving a lot more water down. Yep. Uh, so it would be interesting to, to look at the different numbers from it's, that perspective. It's yeah. also, I think, really interesting to me in that sense because you are getting a lot more of this water back, but there's a bit less pressure to recycle it. That's not universally true, and especially in some areas like the Barnett where you literally are fracking at Dallas-Fort Worth Airport. Everyone can see it. Often you're using drinking water to do it, although I think they made that illegal a couple of years ago. 
um, it's very visible, and it's, like I said, Texas has been in the, in the throes of essentially the new drought of record for the last few years. And so when people are being told, you can't water your lawn, you can't do your laundry, you can't whatever, even though there's, I think, t typically culturally a little bit more of a pro-energy extraction stance down there than there might be out here, seeing this very conspicuous use of water in places where you might not have had that use before, I think, has been pretty unsettling for people. And so hearing the attitudes about what's going on that's kind of, well, you know, we want the gas and we want to be producing it here and we want to make sure that we keep this industry alive, but at the same time, like, my trees all died. Why can you do this and I can't? And prove to me that this is actually important given that prices are low, all that sort of stuff. It's, it's a very different conversation than you get out here from what I can tell, but it's still a very active one. <laughs> Has anyone suggested taking the, the pumped water from the coal and using it for those purposes? I, I would assume it's good for that. They're in pretty different places. Oh, okay. So, unfortunately, it's kind of that nice swath that used to be the ocean coming in from the side. Yeah. So, I think before opening it up entirely to questions, just the one other point I want to make quickly um, with a less pretty chart is the carbon capture and storage point. So if you did start to put carbon capture systems onto the back end of existing natural gas combined cycle plants or pulverized coal plants with existing technologies, and I recognize that there are a lot of things that are being done that are sort of pre-combustion technologies or better amine systems, but amine scrubbers, sticking them on the back of plants that exist already the amount of water that you start using per kilowatt hour jumps really, really dramatically for a couple of reasons. So one being there's a huge parasitic load associated with carbon capture and storage. So because you're using steam to capture your carbon for like cleaning out your amine system and stuff like that, you're taking away steam that would otherwise be diverted through a generator and producing power. So you have a direct electric parasitic load on that side that means you're using a lot more fuel. You're cooling more per per kilowatt hour that you're putting out, stuff like that. And then there's also just the direct water use of those carbon capture systems. So in the coal case, what you see is that you can almost double the amount of water that you're using per kilowatt hour when you start talking about putting an amine system onto the back. The natural gas combined cycle case is a little bit better, again, because they tend to start out more efficient. They've got this air-cooled component and that kind of thing. But still, you're, you're increasing your water consumption by <laughs> over half again. And so just kind of an interesting point as we talk about trying to control carbon at the same time as we're trying to handle our water problems at the same time as we're trying to handle economic issues with electricity, there are a lot of competing things that we're trying to balance here that actually don't all go together. So just throwing that out there is kind of an interesting looming point if we ever do go down that path. Yeah. So pulverized coal efficiency is about 30 percent? In these plants, yeah. And then what, what happens when you have, I have carbon capture and sequestration, how much does that reduce it? Depends who you talk to. Um, a few years ago, the rule of thumb was kind of 30% electrical parasitic load. It's more recent tests, and after they put that system in at Mountaineer, um, would suggest more like 15%. But still, electrical parasitic load, it's pretty big, um, and there's not a whole lot of actual operational data. So once you start throwing in things like load following and stuff like that, it's somewhere between probably 10 and 30 percent. Similar argument, at least on the extraction side, actually applies to dry cooling as well because you've got this parasitic load, so you're using more fuel per um, unit of electricity that you're putting out. You're ultimately using less overall water because you're using less cooling water, but you're using more water to extract, and that water is coming from different places that might be less able to do it or more able to do it. Hard to say, but making certain water choices can throw different water consequences up and down the fuel chain either side. So it's kind of an interesting thing to think about, particularly as we start having more basin transfer of energy. So again, in Texas, most of the, most of the gas that is used down there is produced within the state. That's not really true in the rest of the US. So trading off a water impact in Iowa for one in Pennsylvania or something like that is a pretty real thing. So I think with that, um, yeah, what, just kind of the conclusions, more efficient plants use less water. So efficiency is really, really helpful in this kind of situation. Cooling is the main driver of water consumption. That was a fairly known fact. Previously, people had been saying that extraction was a pretty much negligible use. I think it's more like 10%. Some people would still call that negligible, but cooling's the big driver of water use for the electricity fuel cycle. 
And on the extraction side, again, I think that it's probably not fair to say that it's a negligible amount of water that's going into our, our fuel extraction, particularly when you start thinking about quality impacts and adequacy impacts. And the geology that you're working in matters quite a lot. So especially since they're not here, um, just wanted to acknowledge my co-authors and funding and open it up for questions. Thank you, guys. I actually did throw this in at the last minute. So we use this kind of cool tool that you may or may not have seen um, that came out of Carnegie Mellon, the Economic Input Output Lifecycle Analysis Tool. They basically go on for all sectors of the economy. It's really sweet. You should check it out. <laughs> per dollar of economic impact or economic input in all the major industry categories across the United States, what kind of air emissions, water emissions, water consumption, water withdrawals do you get out? So what we did to get at the propens was basically try to evaluate what's, or in this case, let me think, this example is for the chemicals, but we did a pretty similar thing for propens. Um, try to think about what actually goes into that. So here we looked at basically chemical manufacturing, tried to figure out from a couple of other studies that have been done about how many dollars worth of chemicals go into each well um, and then throw it into the tool. What we decided for our low estimate was that we would only use the water that was directly being put into, into that chemical manufacturer. So here, like, if these are all of the water withdrawals through the whole fuel chain going all the way back to grain farming, as you see, this is again where you start to get layers upon layers upon layers. A conservative way of looking at how much water is actually going into the chemical manufacturing is just to look at the chemical manufacturing line. So that was our low estimate. On the high estimate, we assumed that all of this, and this is a withdrawal basis, but we assumed all water withdrawals that are associated with chemical production were counted as consumption with the exception of the power generation. So we assumed about 1% of the water that was withdrawn for power generation that was feeding these chemical plants was actually being consumed. It's a fairly typical ratio. Um, and then just added those all together. So low estimate, just direct withdrawals for chemical manufacturing. High estimate, direct withdrawals for everything um, and about 1% of the withdrawals for power generation. The prop site is a little bit different only because some of that's actually mined. So we looked at both the mines and something more like this for the manufactured ones. They're ceramics, so it was a different industry, but similar approach. Fortunately, somebody a couple of years ago actually published a study that tried, actually also used this data set, which we figured out later, um, and tried to get a dollars per well figure, which then we could translate into a dollars per MMBTU. So some of that work we were able to validate with this other thing that came out in the middle of us doing this work, so that was really helpful. But yeah, it, it's a data set that is pretty rich and kind of hard to get at, but I think more people are starting to use it. It's interesting. There's a lot more detail. Actually, um, if you are interested, this is an open source paper and the supplementary information is all online too. And there's a lot more on how we did this if you're curious. Anyway, yeah. I can't imagine it makes a big effect, but uh, is there a large difference between the size of the workforce involved in these two d different industries, or did you look at that at all? On water consumption? Well, just, uh, I mean, I, I, again, yes. I, the water consumption of the workers would not make a big right. difference, but I, I would assume it's something well, that you Well, coal miners are really thirsty. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, th there is a pretty big difference in total employment. Coal mines do not employ that many people. Yeah. Um, and because a lot of the gas stuff is rapid and geologically or geographically dispersed, you do see a bit more employment on that side. We started to go down the path of some of the societal impacts of using more gas in Texas versus continuing to import coal or moving away from coal and stuff like that. That gets hairy very quickly. Um, but yeah, ultimately gas generates probably more labor per, per MMBTU in Texas at least. It might be different in other places. Yeah. Texas is a lot 
a little bit. I think ultimately one of the situations there is that since they are all using the same rivers and since a lot of those taxes tend to work on interbasin transfers rather than intercity transfers or something like that, um, I'm not sure how big of a change it would have made. It would be really interesting to look at. There might actually be some impact just because a lot of the gas plants, because they tend to be cleaner where they are, um, are more in urban areas where the coal plants are a little bit outside. So like Austin, for example, has a couple of gas plants very, very in the middle of the city and then the big coal plant 45 minutes outside. Same river, but different water demand areas. So you don't have any of the urban demand by the coal plant. You have a lot of the urban demand by the gas plant. So maybe um, we didn't look at it, though. Recovery options that might be open to these plants in Texas, and, and I guess I don't really know much about um, what technologies are available, how much they would cost, the spent heat, the spent steam after it condenses. Does it does it have to go through a cooling tower and direct it to protect it in the atmosphere? Does it have to be protected into body water, or can we recover? Mm -hmm. That one, I'm not an expert on. I know that there are some some people talking about recovering water off of cooling towers. I'm not sure how effective that is, particularly at older plants. So I actually, I legitimately don't know, so I won't pretend to. Um, but that is an interesting question. A lot of these are actually still once through, though. So you just, you don't have a lot of evaporative loss anyway. That's interesting to think about, though. I'm not sure. On the extraction side, it's a lot of the same stuff that you see elsewhere. It's um, on the gas side, reinjection, recycling, transportation, that kind of thing. On the coal side, it's probably more like just finding a user downstream that is willing to put their hand up and say, yes, that is my water right, and it's associated here, and therefore I'm freeing up my other water right. So Texas is a little bit strange in that it has different sets of water right laws. Um, so traditionally, the the rule has been stated as biggest pump wins. If it's on your property and you can pump it, it's your water, and that is your water right. You're not restricted. Because of droughts and because of urbanization and stuff like that, in certain areas, they've started to get a little bit more prescriptive about who owns a right, assigning senior rights, junior rights, all that sort of thing. So it kind of depends where you are. Um, but yeah, in the, coal, in the coal case, probably just identifying somebody who's willing to speak up for that water and claim it instead of their other right would be one option. No, and the big reason for that is that we just couldn't get the data on the gas side. Um, the argument on the coal side is that because it's mandated that you meet certain quality standards, you have a pretty good idea of what's in the water. I would question that without actually being able to go take samples, um, just based on the history of coal industries. I think these guys are probably probably pretty close to their, their regulated limits, um, just based on some of the other stuff that I know about those mines. But, yeah, on, on the gas side, we started out really hoping that we could do a lot of quality analysis and the data just aren't there. So that would be great. And I hope that over the next few years, especially some of these more underdeveloped basins start to have more wells associated with them, that we actually will be able to get more information. Because Texas now also has disclosure rules about what you're actually putting down hole, that kind of thing. So between that and a lot of research that's going on in the state because it's a, it's a fairly big piece of the economy down there, the gas side anyway. I hope that we will have enough data to do that soon. <laughs> have you been able to do that out here? People are trying. Yeah. We need to keep trying because I think it would be interesting. <laughs> I phrased that poorly. So like this chart applies to the stuff you're exporting to. I guess what I, what I should have said and how I should have said that is that we only looked at the gas that was being used in the power sector. So we assumed that the gas used in the power sector has the same profile as all the gas that's being produced. But we did have a little bit of a challenge initially deciding you know, which gas really is being used in the power sector. And if you started to add on a whole bunch of new gas demand because you started switching from coal to gas or something like that,
which guess would you put on first? Would you assign only the conventional guess that's cheap to produce? Would you assign the expensive guess that nobody, maybe there's not demand for unless you start adding your own internal demand? So the marginal piece of gas that you would actually burn in Texas, it's not clear whether that's one of the more water intensive or one of the less water intensive pieces of gas, so we ultimately went with the average. But that was a little bit of a speech artifact from a long, long debate that ultimately resulted in us just taking an average. But yeah, like you can make the argument that in the absence of external markets and if everything collapsed and you wanted to keep running power plants in Texas, you would just use the easiest gas to get. You can also make the argument that you have all these contracts outside, so you will use the hardest gas in state. So. But cost and water use don't always go together either. So <laughs> going down a rabbit hole here a little bit, but we can talk about it more later if you want. Yeah. Um, you hear sort of out, out of the Rocky Mountains um, that sort of water use for agriculture is uh, coming up against water use for hydraulic fracturing. Not, not because they're anywhere in the same vicinity in terms of demand, it's largely the perception. Yeah. Um, in, in Texas, is are the areas where they're withdrawing groundwater for hydraulic fracturing, is that coincident with the areas where there's significant agriculture? Yes. Agriculture? That's partially, not in every case, but there are enough shale basins that and Texas is agricultural enough still that yes, a lot of it's ranch land, admittedly, so it's not like the great fields of corn that you might have elsewhere. But yeah, I mean, the, a lot of the Texas cattle started getting herded basically north because there wasn't enough water to keep them alive in the last couple of years. And so yeah, it, it definitely is a real trade-off. And one of my colleagues actually has done a little bit of work trying to see how you could do transfers between agriculture and energy production by like having the gas producers pay for more efficient watering systems and stuff like that. So they are coincident for sure. Has it, it come to a head between like the, the ranchers and, and uh, the drillers? They're often the same people. <laughs> <laughs> so that's not universally true, but just in terms of who actually has huge bits of land and who actually owns all the rights to that land because it's been in their family for a long time or whatever. So they've got the mineral rights and the surface rights. The ranches are where you're drilling. <laughs> So yes, it's, it's a trade-off, and I think it's, it's an interesting economic thing to watch too, because depending on gas prices versus beef prices, for example, you might trade off which one you're devoting more water to in a given year. Um, I'm speaking a bit off the cuff, I actually haven't looked into that specifically, but I suspect that you probably would see that effect a little bit. But yeah, it's, it's interesting, because there's shale everywhere. Um, so well, a, lot of the, a lot of the shale as development is moving toward the southwest because that's where the liquids are. Yep, you know, exactly. Gas prices are low, oil prices are still high. So. And that's an ag area too. Yeah, interesting. I don't know how many of you have seen the NASA pictures. Jim and I were talking about it a little bit earlier, but just looking down and being able to see all the flares in the Bakken and, and then being able to see the Eagle Ford as well. I still have some questions about whether that's electrical light or flares or both, um, but. And the Bakken's. The Bakken's yeah. flares, <laughs> yeah. But. general questions about Texas and how this may or not relate. It's a great place. It, really? Okay. <laughs> I'll get back to you. I'll visit. Um, so I know Texas, most of Texas is like a very strange deregulated energy market. So if that causes any weird complications. It's, it's what California did right before the major power crisis. One of the classes I took at UT actually, the professor basically walked in and is like, we didn't fix any of the problems that they had, but Enron's out of business now, so maybe we'll be okay. Um, that aside, yes, um, it, it is a pretty interesting thing because you have the gas plants and the coal plants competing really, really, truly directly here. I mean, energy utilities in Texas have gotten to the point where they'll like offer to send you flowers on your birthday is one of the advantages that you have for choosing. I mean, it's, it's pretty funny actually sometimes or like free power during the Super Bowl, stuff like that. Like it's a little gimmicky almost at this point. I think UT itself actually has branded electricity now. So you pay a little bit of a premium and that goes to the university. Anyway, um, it's, an, it's a wild market down there a bit. And that does have some impacts on how these plants actually operate that I don't think that the data sets that we use necessarily incorporated. Most of our plant level data was kind of 2008 to 2010, which is before most of the competitive, completely deregulated um, nodal market 
started to come online. Now, what you would probably see is that because more coal plants and even more of the natural gas baseload plants themselves um, are being asked to load follow more than they were before, because it's no longer as simple as just ERCOT saying, um, that's the grid in Texas, just saying, you know, you go, you go, you go, but it's actually competitive at the time of running. Um, you probably see efficiency drops for some of the plants, and that probably means that they're using a little bit more of their water. It's not Wyoming. Um, so yeah, the, the big federal swaths of land you don't have to the same extent as you do in a lot of the West proper. Um, I think most of it's privately owned. There are some really, really big parks, but most of the places where you actually have production, I think, are privately owned. And do they allow drilling on, on public land? Depends on which public land you're talking about. So like, um, perfect example being both UT and Texas A&M are land grant universities. One of the big issues, and this is like a strange diversion into Texas politics, but one of the big issues is that the land that the University of Texas system was given is in the Permian Basin. So there's a lot of oil there that goes directly to the university. That's all considered public. The land that A&M got is a lot more agricultural, less oil revenue from it. So the money balance to the two schools comes out differently. So like in that sense, there is public land and this has an effect on how the state works. Um, but I don't know how significant that is overall. <laughs>